Welcome to Extremely, a podcast from the ADL Center on Extremism. I'm Warren Siegel. And I'm Jessica Reeves. In this episode, we're going to focus on the Nova Music Festival, which was attacked by Hamas on October 7th, 2023. 1,200 people were killed on that day, and there remain over 120 hostages still in Gaza. Unclear how many of those are alive. The effects of that day, the deadliest attack against the Jewish community uh, since the Holocaust, uh, has sparked a lot of activity around the world, including massive protests against Israel, record levels of anti-Semitism. The impact of that day is still reverberating everywhere around the world. Our featured guest, Chen Almag, was there. We will ask her to tell us about what she experienced, how she escaped, and a range of other questions that are as important today as they were on the day that this happened. We will also explore the Nova Music Festival exhibition in New York City, which is designed to commemorate the festival and the lives lost. Lastly, we'll discuss the recent surge in demonstrations around the country, including ones that took place at the exhibit in New York and the increasingly radical nature of the messages and language at those protests. But first, Jessica, we should probably catch up. We need to address the uh, the tiny door in the room. See, yeah, so beyond that, and can we put a, a hold on that? But like <laughs> people can see us now, right? right so exactly. before where they would just hear our you know dulcet tones talking about really important issues, now they could see the actual horror on our faces when we're talking about <laughs> the issues. And, they um, can. They yeah. can. How do you and, feel about uh, that? either, you know, you're welcome or we're very sorry. Yeah. Um, how do you feel? How do you feel about that? How does this me, change? Me personally? Yeah. How do you feel about being like people seeing your face when you're talking about these issues and not just hearing your voice? I mean, look, we, we do what we must for the cause of fighting extremism, Oren. And uh, these are what, the... What just, what, what just happened? Did somebody flip a switch and you became... <laughs> Like, is this Chad GPT, Jessica? Yes, we do what we must. Uh, you know, I think it's going to take a little bit of time for me to get used to it. Uh, I suspect it will be the same for our uh, listeners slash viewers. But, um, you know, I am looking forward to, you know, people getting familiar with your album selections mm. uh, and your frog, who has become a real uh, important part of uh, the COE family. Yes, thank you. and And... And we love your brick wall and <laughs> and not that any of us are vain or care so much, but just for what it's worth in real life, my face is not this long. Our first effort at, at relaunching and, and our first episode, and uh, I, I think people will really be interested in, in hearing what uh, the perspectives from, from our guest. You should know uh, there's going to be some descriptions uh, of what um, this individual went through that are not going to be easy to hear, but you know her bravery and ability to tell those stories are really important, and we're glad that she did. And we will see um, as this develops, whether or not we're comfortable with our faces being on video, but we are going to try to continue to bring stories uh, about what we're seeing to bring guests to help explain some basic questions. So thanks so much for joining us. You know, Jessica, please take it away to start us off. Ken, thank you so much for being here. I'm really grateful that you were able to join us. Um, and I'm really looking forward to having you share your story with our listeners. Can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to go to the music festival, what it kind of represented to you and, and just, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you ended up there. You know, when, when you ask this question, you know, you can see how I'm, I'm smiling because the Nova festival was um, a festival for, for trans music and the whole point in trans music is to be free, to dance um, barefoot, to feel the ground, to, to be nice to other people, to accept everybody and to celebrate life and, and happiness. That's the reason I went to the Nova Festival. And, you know, uh, I remember that the ticket was very expensive. And when I step in and I took like a walk inside the festival, I told my friend the price was really worth it. Yeah. So like many stories that we've heard, people showed up 
to have a celebration, to get closer with each other and, and, and the music, etc. And then obviously things took a terrible turn. Can you talk a little bit about sort of when you knew that this was not the event that you thought you were coming to, to attend? Yes. Um, it catch me during dancing, you know, six, 6.29 in the morning, the music shut shut down the music stopped and i just i just start saw people doing like this you know looking to up to the sky so i i took my head up you know i raised my head up and i just saw rain of rockets i i never saw something like that and since we 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 were young in israel um they teach us in the school that if you under rocket attack and you outside from a shelter you need to lay on the ground and put your hands on the head so i didn't know what to do but you know everyone was hysterical and just started yelling and crying and it was a big chaos no one knew what to do and so from that point when you realized that something was wrong kind of can you tell us a little bit about what you experienced in the next like minutes and even hours and of course um so just like i said it was um big big rocket attack and no one didn't realize that there are terrorists inside of israel because we didn't have a signal there or wi-fi or nothing the phones we, we didn't care about the phones and the internet, but we started to realize that something bad happened in the south of Israel now. Like, in my head, it was, oh, um, Gaza attack us again. Like, this is usual thing. I grew up like this. It's not, it's not something special for me. And I decided to go to my car. Um, even though I know it's wrong, I knew that I need to be in a shelter to I, I needed to drive to a shelter so me and my friend decided to, to get out from the party from the festival to go to the uh, parking lot was big mess there you know three thousand people that try to go from a parking lot it's not it's not something easy it's not something that i think can happen um so we stand in the traffic line line big big one and then I saw all, all the cars that stopped before in front of me. Um, I saw them leave their cars, like with the door open and everything, and just start running back. And I'm with my um, car window closed. I I didn't realize what 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 they doing. So I just opened the the window a little bit, and I remember this one girl. She screamed. They hear. He was here. He was shouting. He was he was screaming Allah Akbar and everything. And in 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 a moment, it, it was like a second. I didn't realize what I'm I'm gonna do. But my friend just told me. She yelled about me. Can go out right now, and we just started running. And I I, I really I was so shocked. I was I, I I didn't know what's going on around me. You know, I just listened to order. I, I it was. It was terrifying because in the moment we started running, um, it was the first uh, gunshot that I hear. It was the first bullet that I hear. And and I started running in the in the big field. And and I saw I saw people just fall, you know, like they got they got they got shot. They got shot and people screaming and crying and asking for help because they got shot in the leg or they got shot in the head and and no one can help them and everyone just run you know for them life and I I freeze I freeze in the middle of the in the field and you know it's like ducks in ray, shooting range mm -hmm. this is how I felt really. And me and my friend that we ran together, we separate in that moment. We didn't um, make it together. 
and I don't know how much time I freezed, but after a few minutes, I decided I need to go hide. The chaos is still around me. I still can hear the gunshot and everything, and, and, I'm, I, and I'm all by myself. And I still don't know what's going on, you know, around me. In the moment I get inside a bush, I was panicked for my life. I, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't watch what's going on because I heard the gunshot come really close to me. And I can tell you, in, in the minute I raised my head, it looks like when you see death in front of you, like, but it was pure, pure evil of death, you know? I saw them, I saw them, I saw what I'm doing for, for this one man. I can't, I still can't say those specific words of what they, he did to him, but I can't, I, you know, I can't take this picture from my mind. It's forever with me. Um, after I, I decide to get out from the bush, um, I, I decide to get out because I uh, heard the gunshot um, getting far. And I decided to go out because I heard someone, he screams, whoever he, who can, can, you need to go back to the cars, whoever who can. So I just, you know, look around, start running. I didn't know, you know, northwest. I didn't know nothing. And I, I, I saw one of my friends from, from my, my unit in army. I saw him and I, I called him, I yelled, I screamed and he ran into me and I, I don't know, you need, you need to understand, I don't know what's happened to him until this point. I, I saw him last time in the, in the dancing floor, in the dance area. He, he saw one thing and nothing else. Like he, he was like, I need to go home no matter what. It's like tunnel vision, yeah. Yes, and I was so happy that I found him because he he like controlled the situation. He told me what to do. He like managed me. This is what they teach me in army when I need to do with someone in shock. Exactly. I was a combat. I know what to do. But I was the shock. I was the one in shock now. So basically, we we get to the um the cars area the where where I left my car and it was like nightmare there. Really bodies, dead bodies everywhere, blood everywhere. Um. The, the smell, you know, the smell of people that, you know, burn because they also blowed cars and it was terrible, really. But even though all of this, I found my car and my car was with one scratch, one, nothing happened. And I succeed to start the car and tell my friend he get inside the driver uh, seat because I, I couldn't, I couldn't drive at all. And he took us to the place where um, one officer stopped, blocked the road and he was shaking, you know, with his little gun, he was shaking. And in that moment, I saw the tank, the one tank in the Nova, if you know the story, I saw him, I saw this tank just passing me really fast. This is the only unit, the only, you know, people that can save me that I saw. It's the only, you know, IDF thing that I saw. And I'm a soldier in the IDF in that moment. I was feeling like I was bounded. Okay, really. Tal and I, was we, we passed through this, the, the tank passed through us and we took the like farmer road that the officer uh, told us to go. Like he was doing like this and shaking, and we took this road and we didn't know what's and what's what's gonna wait for us in the end of the end. It, it was one car in front of us, um, like be, 
uh, before of us, like ahead. And uh, three guys try run there outside and try to open the cars to get, you know, get himself um, out. So one guy came inside to our car and he also was panic. He just started to, um, he catch like the, the, the backseat and in, in, you know, so it was like a hard and all his legs was scratch and blood. And I don't know what happened to this guy. He didn't speak. I asked him if he needs something. He didn't speak. So I just passed him a bottle of water and, you know, wait. So we get to the end of the road and it was like a T, you know, T, T road. And we didn't know where, which way to go now, but we opened the maps because no Wi-Fi, no signal. We don't know, we, no GPS. And we just open um, the maps in the phone and we know how to navigate in, with maps. We learn it in army. So I saw Kibbutz Berry to my right and to my left, Kibbutz Reim. And we know that Kibbutz Berry, it's the way home. So we decided to, to, to took the way to right to Kibbutz Berry. And I don't know how to call it. Maybe it's touch of heaven. Maybe it's a miracle. But in the moment, my friend took the right. He pressed the radio in my car and it works. The first thing we heard, it was attacking Berry. Mm. And he just like, do you know, drift. So he took the other road and we, this is how I got home, basically, in that road. I was going to, I was going to ask you, you know, if there are any individuals who played a significant role in your ability to get out of there. And it, and it sounds like, you know, there, there, are, there are several. I know it's, it's something I, I can't explain. You know, I still, I don't know how to explain it because in my head, I don't know how I'm, I'm here today. Really. There are some religious people in Israel and someone told me, Chen, you got, uh, God, God, um, he, he, he protect you. God protects you. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't accept it because what's the difference between the guy that killed next to me and I didn't, I don't know what's the difference between us, you know? So I can't explain how I'm here exactly. I don't know. That's such a hard thing to process, I imagine. And, you know, you want to celebrate survival and being alive, but you can't, you know, you're also very aware of the people like, who did, you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. Have you been able to kind of process this? Does talking about it help or does it set you back? Or is it kind of like one step forward, two steps back? My my story is a little bit um, complicated because I, I told you before, I, I was still... Uh, a soldier during um, the Nova, during this October 7. I was one month before I need to finish my service and get out. It, it's supposed to be really um, special time and happy and everyone's so excited for their, you know, finish and graduate army. And three, ba three days after October 7, I got back to my unit. I needed to go back. I, I got, like, after... I, I had like this feeling now, this is my duty now. Now everything that I learned, it's come to real, you know? So I came back uh, really fast from the Nova because uh, my, my unit needed me and I didn't have any time to process, you know? I was going back, going back to, to my unit and just start fighting. And with every, I was in their artillery, by the way, and every uh, bomb that we shot, I was like, I didn't, I didn't want it to revenge, but you know, I saw what they did and I was so angry and so mad. I don't believe in revenge and I don't believe that people need to be in war. And I, I hope one day we can have peace, but every bomb every gun, every shot, I was, thank you. 
thank you because what i saw is it's bad really i i'm not i'm not wishing this for my you know biggest enemy ever for anyone and and i'm sure this is there's actually never going to be a good time to sort of answer this question as i imagine this continues to evolve but how has your perspective on sort of humanity and life changed right i mean the even the stories that you were saying about feeling like why why was i able to get out and others like these these are stories you know that we hear from holocaust survivors right and you know the, the sort of the guilt of getting through it but you did right and that's important and but yeah. your perspective now on has it how, how has it changed other than you know how has it changed in, just in general in terms of your understanding of your your place in the world, which I know is a is a unfair and huge question? It's a huge question, but a lot of my perspective changed. It's funny. It's funny that you you did guilt. You know, the guilt feeling is it was really big part of my of my every day. You know, I felt guilty all the time. I still feel guilty sometimes, but. I'm I'm starting getting better right now, but the first guilt that I I got was why didn't I save more more people? I told you I saved one. Why couldn't I save more? And how I say it, you know? I told you that um, I felt like that I'm I'm not so special. I'm not different from the people that murdered their, you know, not murder, they, they slaughtered, they slaughtered. This is the word. And this is how people need to call it. Um, I'm sorry, it's difficult to think about it. And yeah, my, I think my, how we call it, and me trusting people it's it's different now mm -hmm. and I, I always felt like i'm so safe in israel and we have the strongest army and the strongest you know security and everything and and it's not you know it's not because who thought that something like this could happen after holocaust right no there are people really mean mean in this world and i'm not believing anymore that there are still people in gaza that don't want to they don't want to they don't want me to be dead this is how i feel today and i didn't feel like this before october 7 but i saw things that i i just can't you know i i can't refuse them yeah. and I, i'm seeing i, I I'm avoiding um, news and stuff and protest and just things that people sent me. But I see how people like deny what's going on mm -hmm. and and say things that I, I'm 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 telling myself like how these people can say those lies. I I've been there. I've been there. I saw. I saw, and this is what exactly my grand grandma told me. She was in Auschwitz, yeah. and it's the same. It's the same. I, I don't want to compare. Really, I, I never wanted to compare, but it's really, really similar. Really, and the idea of you know some some group that wanna end another race like to delete them how it's you know we two we are in 2024 what's going on i'm i'm talking with you now with my you know my macbook what 100 years ago they didn't have cell phone wow I, I, how this is can happen yeah unbelievable i don't know you know what's not not similar to the holocaust in the Holocaust, we don't have a lot of recordings of the torture that they needed to, to been through. And now they record everything, everyone recording everything, including Israel, 
yeah everyone and yeah. i think this is the main thing that bother me in in the war i think you know when you've come up close like you have to evil and you've seen what people are capable of being able to recalibrate and kind of be in the world again I imagine it just changes everything. It just changes the way you see the world. It changes the way you see your surroundings. What would it take for you to feel safe again, do you think? I think I always, you know, look look around, look look behind my my shoulder. I think yeah. I'll, I'll never, you know, get off the PTSD things that happened to me after. I think it will take a lot of time. I hope I live full life until 120. I I hope one day I can sit back, you know, when I'll, I'm old and be happy and tell myself thank 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 you world for everything you gave to me because life it is worth it and I know it now. And after October 7, in the first few months, I, I thought to myself that life isn't worth it. And it is. It's a big gift, really. And I'm crying and I'm saying it because everyone needs to know it. And no one needs to take another person's life. For, you know, any, for any reason, you know, for any reason. You know, I think it's for... for our audience, it's important to hear your perspective, a not to necessarily combat all those who deny that it happened, but it helps, you know, we need to have on record the stories of the people who, who made it through and what they saw. Um, but I also think a lot of people who are attracted to, unfortunately, the work that we do of combating violence and extremism and anti-Semitism are curious about ways that they can cope with, you know, the trauma and, you know. And, you know, I'm not suggesting that all of a sudden you're a psychologist and a trauma expert, but, you know, maybe, maybe you are to some degree. Is there something that you could talk about, like what, what you've used, what you've relied on, or is it, is it people or to help you get through? Because I think that also provides people with some hope that they can also seek those things yes. out. I have really good friends. Um, actually, I have really good friends. Uh, from America, from the U.S., uh, I I met them in a birthright, and a few of them was really good friend for me in this you know whole time, and I think what people most should know with trauma, you know, not to push the person that stand in front of you, because if you push them, you know, tell me what happened. Uh, the the first thing that people want to know is how it met you, like how it happened to you. And I know it's from curious and, and people just want to know it from, from um, not from bad reason, um, from innocent reason. And I think the first thing is not to push. And if this person will want to say and tell you your sto his story, he will. It's happened to me a lot of times that I meet a new person and we just start talking and just like a second, I feel comfortable to share with him just from the energy he gives me, from the energy that is here with me. We now together, we're sitting here and everything is okay. This is what helps me the most and be with my family and, you know, in warm area, uh, not in combat also. No, I think that's helpful. I think one of the things we've seen repeatedly and, you know, over the course of all of this is this crazy misrepresentation, as you said, of, of somebody's lived experience. Um, yeah. We've seen these people denying what you saw and heard and felt the, on that day. What do you want people to know? What, what do you want to say maybe to the people who are... <sighs> who are out there denying things or are out there, you know, just asking questions. Um, and 
What do you want them to know? What do you want them to go away with? I want them to go away with that. I think there are always two sides of the coin. Okay. I think there will be always bad people and good people. Okay. This is the nature. I get it. But you just need to imagine. I don't know how, how to explain, you know, it's, it's a hard question because it's hard for me to tell, to explain to people to deny slaughter in people. I want them to go home with my lips, say that I was there, read my lips. I, I was there. I yeah. felt it. I, I saw it. I cried there. I, I saw some of my worst ever nightmare that anyone can, can see in his life. And I'm still here and I'm still here. And this is how the Israel is. And this is how the Jewish um, people was always. So we are here and we're still here. And for me, I don't care if people want to deny. I know what's true. I know what's the truth of me, you know. This is what matter and yeah. Yeah, you know, one of the one of the things that was difficult for us that I'll say for me to to see here in in America afterwards where there are all these missing posters of you not missing but hostage posters, right? Bring them back and including, you know, kids. And you had uh, people who were ripping them down because they felt that somehow these were fake, right? And, mm -hmm. and to me, I thought this was an American phenomenon, right? When in America, you have school shootings that happen all the time, terrible mass shootings, and immediately you have conspiracy theorists who deny it, right? Whether it's in Sandy Hook or... And, and to me, the, the denial of Jewish suffering to me felt like, all right, is this just an extension of people believe they would rather believe in a conspiracy? But then it's like you look online and the narratives and the images and the creations there, and it was immediate. It They didn't wait. It was immediate to deny, um, which for me is why it's important to have um, like the, the, the exhibition, right? The, the music fe festival exhibition, yeah. which is reminding people not only did it happen, but here's what it was intended to be. The yeah. positivity, the bringing people together, right? And, and, you can't deny all of that. And yet we saw in New York, and you may be aware of this, is people protesting that. I mean, people saying that, you know, uh, long live October 7th in New York City. By the way, I'm sure you know, there's a couple of Jews in New York, right? I mean, I, mean, I think they knew, <laughs> yeah, they knew who they were, you know, what their audience was. And again, like, this is the work that we do is trying to figure out how do we, you know, fight, you know, lies with truth? How do you hold people accountable? But Jessica and I have a luxury in a sense of, you know, we weren't also there. I will tell you, um, obviously, you know, the memories are emotional. Like if I went through something and somebody denied it in that to that level, I wouldn't have nearly the amount of patience and the mindfulness that I'm seeing um, in you and, and other people who are telling their story. Yes, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of Nova survivors that doing um, in the world and the turning the story from their eyes. And I think all of us doing it because we know how important it is to speak, you know, that people can he hear from, from first, you know, first year, you know, that's from someone that went, been there and I know how important it is. So this is why I decided to do it. And I'm, I'm going to keep doing it, you know, every Every time, every opportunity I'll have, I'll do it. And I keep sharing my story. And maybe, maybe it will change one, one man, one, one woman, maybe. And this is how I'm, I'm doing my duty now, I think. Well, we're so grateful that you um, are here with us and that you were kind enough to share your experience with us and our listeners. And I know that it will have a huge impact. So please, please know that and be confident that 
you know, these conversations really, they make a huge difference. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Ken, thank you so much for, for making the time to, to join us. Of course. Um, you know, we know it's not easy. And yeah, it's late in Israel. Now you can see how the light changed. (laughs) It's not easy. It's late and you still did it right? You still did it. So, so thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. Yeah. And please take good care of yourself. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I appreciate her stopping by. That was, uh, you know, intense at times, obviously, you know, people are still going through a lot of feelings who have had to survive that. But, um, you know, like I, like I said to her, I I really think it's important for people to hear, uh, these stories. Yeah. I mean, incredibly, powerful and incredibly important for everyone to hear. So Jessica, why the hell uh, is what is happening happening? And what can we do to uh, not only educate people about it, but maybe even to offer solutions? So uh, appreciate being on this ride with you, Jessica. Thanks, Oren. Same, same. Why don't we get to you know, some of the stuff that has uh, been keeping us busy um, since we wrapped up season three and now that we're relaunching season four. Yeah, I thought you were going to say keeping us up at night, which is also true True. um, in many cases. Yeah, so welcome to season four, episode one. We probably should have said that at the very top of the episode, but here we are, a new season, a new look, and uh, yeah, a new set of horrors to discuss. On that note, uh, we just published a piece relatively recently. Our, our dis and misinformation analyst published a piece um, about Suno, which is a, um, a GAI, so a generative AI music creation, like song and album creation program slash platform. And there are a couple of these platforms. Um, and unsurprisingly, probably for our listeners, Suno is now being, let's say, harnessed by a lot of extremists and and bigots um, to create some really hateful music. Um, You know, you can feed these prompts into Suno. Um, I thought that perhaps we should create a Suno song for this podcast. Uh, You rightly pointed out that maybe we didn't want to be giving them just free publicity. I mean, we're talking about them, but but I think, you know, for for the for the audience, it's not just one platform. You know, anybody who's been using some of these, some of these tools is like, all you have to do is say, I want a song about Jessica Reeves and her dog. And I want it to be country music. (laughs) And I want it to be about how they fell in love or something like that. Oh, that's right. No, no, this is an example. And what it'll do is spit out like a, almost like a polished pop song, right? Because it's using, history of music to or some history of music in order to to relay it and what is actually pop music other than a very formulaic thing anyway so it sounds like like a believable in some cases what you would hear on the radio so of course to your point what people are doing is giving it very racist and anti-semitic and hateful and extremist prompts so it's creating this music right well and to be fair you know these these programs and platforms do have something in the way of they have some guardrails set up. So these people are actually being, who are going in to abuse the platform are actually being pretty smart about their approach. Well, smart in quotation marks, in that they are using coded language. That One of the examples that our analysts pointed out was that someone went in and gave it a prompt around white power, but phrased white power as, or framed white power as a new green form of energy. So it, huh. the, the program spat out this song about like this, this great new thing called white power, which was going to save the planet. So it was actually, I mean, I don't, we don't like to give extremists, you know, props, but I mean, they're using some clever ways to get around what are actually not terrible restrictions set up by the platforms. Unfortunately, you know, we see this happen again and again with dog whistles and, and carefully phrased sort of alternative language. But in any event, Suno is now being sued along with another GAI music uh, platform for copyright violation. So we saw that saw that coming and they're being yeah. asked to pay something like $150,000 per song generated. 
because yeah. the argument is they're just taking, as you said, from the library of past music. I mean, not to sound like a, an old person, but, you know, I, I kind of <laughs> am. But like if you told me 20 years ago that, you know, you could get a tool that will en enable like Frank Sinatra's voice to sing like, you know, Notorious B.I.G. song, yeah. I'd be like, wow. But then <laughs> how that was going to be somehow also an application of some sort that, you know, trolls and bad actors and extremists would use too, because of course it's available to anybody. Right. I'd be like, oh, all right. Like that's a world that'll be interesting to live in. And guess what? We're, we're here. We sure are. We sure are. So yeah, you should check out uh, our website. We'll put it in any show notes that we have as well, a link to this, because it's not just about this one platform or this one strategy, uh, but it's really a reminder of the need as new technologies developed at a very early stage for people to sort of anticipate how it might be exploited yeah. um, and, and, you know, and put in some, some, as you said, guardrails against that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we want to educate platforms too. Like those who are operating in good faith, we want to remind them, hey, there are ways to circumvent the good faith, you know, restrictions that you've put in place. And, you know, we just think about this all the time. And I do think that there are platforms that just come up and they don't necessarily give the same attention that we do to, well, hopefully no one is giving the same amount of attention to extremism as we are, but we're here to help. <laughs> I think so. You know, some people who are not here to help Warren. Yeah, that's my segue. Do tell. Segue this of transition the day. is so not on the nose. But who is here to help? <laughs> no, they're not here to help. Is right. Who's here anti, not to help? The anti-Israel and 100% anti-Semitic protesters of many in New York City who targeted the exhibition around the Nova Music Festival last month, who... <sighs> Um, targeted the Brooklyn Museum, this group in particular within our lifetime are escalating these tactics in a way that, you know, is reflective of, of the trends that we're seeing around the country. At this point, I think we can all agree that nothing that is happening on that front is either pro-Palestinian or pro-peace. It's just, it's just anti-Semitism. And it's alarming to see, but I want to, I want to know sort of what you're, what you're thinking about. Yeah. So, you know, I still think that, you know, post sort of campus encampments, although some of that stuff is still going on, there's an entire summer here where we're seeing other activities related to the conflict overseas. And I feel like more hardcore people are sort of involved in this. Not not all of them believe every last thing that we're hearing. I don't think anybody who engages in a protest, by the way, is anti-Semitic in any way. But there are certain things that we are seeing at protests that are really raising red flags to me the way that they did at other protests we have seen from other groups and movements in previous years. So increasingly like Hamas, Hezbollah, PFLP flags showing up at these events, right? One uh, sign in front of the Nova exhibit in New York on June 10th said, basically Zionists are not humans, right? So dehumanizing their targets. Mm -hmm. Another said, long live October 7th, right? So it's now like the celebration of a massacre. It's the glorification and legitimization or efforts to of terrorist organizations. In California, we've seen three arsons in and around the University of Berkeley, one targeting a cop car, one, uh, I think a, a hall, I don't know if it was a student hall, uh, another construction site, but it was claimed by a group as retribution for what campuses were doing in terms of the anti-Israel protests and right. because of, you know, the opposition to Israel. And then just to keep it going, right, you have somebody on a train in New York City saying, you know, raise your hand if you're a Zionist, you know, kind of trying to single people out. You had yeah. people who you mentioned the Brooklyn Museum, uh, the the head of the board of directors is targeted with a a red triangle, you know, spray painted, calling them a white supremacist Zionist. Again, this is at people's homes. Yeah. We know where this ends up when yeah. the rhetoric of dehumanization and support for terror groups becomes the norm. When people are willing to protest an exhibit in honor of like in commemor commemoration of the lives of people who were massacred. Right. Like this is not normal. No. And we have a whole summer filled with what I anticipate is going to be more of this. And um, 
like I'm not here to just like express random outrage. Like I'm really concerned about where this goes because this is not a controlled environment. Right. Right. Yeah. And I just, I just truly believe that a lot of people have lost the thread. Like they have just 100% lost sight of what they may have originally been protesting for or against and are now just being sucked into this sort of vortex that is just pure vitriol and like hate and lies. And I, it's hard for me to square kind of like this idea that people claim to be protesting on behalf of the Palestinian civilian population, but they're out there, as you said, waving flags of a terrorist organization. It doesn't compute for me. I just feel like we've we've reached a point of like disconnect where mm-hmm. I think, you know, and we saw this sometime, we saw this with the encampments. We saw, you know, reporters asking people, what are you here? What do you want to achieve here? What are you here to protest? And occasionally there would just be these responses that were sort of stumbling. And clearly people were not even aware of the primary issues at stake. And I, I wonder if this, like, and again, I'm not excusing or like making excuses for people who are making very, very bad decisions um, and who are expressing vile and hateful rhetoric. I'm just saying, like, I think there's a mob mentality here that you see in in all extremist movements, honestly. Like, I think we can connect this back to some of the other movements that we've covered, some of the other, um, you know, like extreme iterations of belief systems. Um, people like to belong to something. They like to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. And I just think it's such a dangerous sort of like alchemy there where I think people can get sucked into this and it's just, it's incredibly dangerous. Yeah. And, you know, I I definitely think there's people who are sort of testing the waters out, may not fully know what's going on or naive or impressionable and all that. And, you know, I'm I'm concerned about that, right? That that's part of like a, a, a group that sort of normalizes some of this stuff that, that is not helpful at this point though i'm i'm really concerned about those who like it's no real way around the fact that they kind of know what they're doing so yeah. for example in new york there was like as part of one of the flags recently there was the the houthis right which we've talked about in a previous episode the flag says it reads god is great death to the usa death to israel curse the jews victory to islam okay like i th- that's pr- like if right. <laughs> it's telling you exactly, yeah. you know, you don't have to guess, yeah. you don't have to like, yeah, okay, what's the context that. here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And again, I'm not suggesting that people are just like these innocent lambs who are being led to the yeah. slaughter. I just mean that I, I have sincere doubts about people's basic understanding of like geopolitics and like world history. When I look at these people who are protesting, I think like, yeah, I don't want to just describe, you know, idiocy to everybody, but I, you know, yeah. I think we we have a failure of education, I think, and a failure of empathy and a failure of just sort of basic humanity um, on display at all of these protests, as far as I can tell. Certainly in many of them. And, and, and it's really unnecessary because I think there's a lot of people that have a lot of, you know, legitimate concerns about what is happening, right? Yeah, and and, and we've said it before, you can care. And I certainly do and know a lot of people, uh, both in ADL and, and just around my life that care deeply about Palestinian people, right to self-determination. Yes. And yes. that can exist at the same time that we condemn the dehumanization of Israelis and Jews right. at these protests. And, and that's yeah. what our job is. And those two things can exist at the same time. And people who tell you that they don't are full of and the yep. reason I said that is I want to see if we're actually going to bleep it or not. <laughs> just just a test, a small test. Yeah, I think there are ways we, we can all criticize many decisions made by governments, uh, many governments as a whole, without it descending into attacking people as a group, as a whole. And that goes for all sides here. Yeah. I'm glad you brought the the good news. You raised these two topics. Thanks. I think uh, yeah, always you know, here to spread we... some sunshine. So, Orin, it's that it's that time again where I ask you what is what's keeping you afloat. What's your life raft during this incredibly challenging time? Okay, so I promise that and, you know I'm not going to just say key lime pie every time. Um, so I will say 
uh, one of the ways that I um, find a little time away from, you know, hate, violent and extremism. I'm a huge New York Knicks fan. And for all the those that don't care. OK, for all of those that do, um, you're all probably very excited with me that the Knicks are putting together a team, bringing in a whole bunch of people, resigning and their commitment uh, to winning a championship uh, that has never existed in my lifetime. For me, if the Knicks win a championship, I literally will start walking and never stop and you'll never hear from me again. So if for no other reason, folks, to root for the Knicks, Which I will just direction disappear. are you walking? In, into Don't the water or the other way? Don't worry about it. Bottom line <laughs> okay. is, bottom line is, uh, the potential of what can be, it's kind of like America. It's not always what it is, but it's the potential of what it can be. Right. Um, I find that also in our work sometimes, but also in my beloved New York Knicks, that is keeping me uh, afloat uh, during these well, difficult times. How about you? We are also a big uh, basketball household, but I will say that for me personally, it's been very, well, I think for most of the country, it's been incredibly hot. I have now um, identified about 10 different uh, popsicles slash ice cream, uh, <laughs> ice cream uh, things that I really enjoy. And yesterday I returned home with all 10. So that is the entirety of our freezer at this point. And it is all I'm eating pretty much. Uh, so yes, send key lime pies and, um, and ice cream. It may sound like nothing, but it could be everything. 